I would ask you if any of you went outside to play in the wind, but probably not. That kite would fly you in the wind. That was some wind. Ryan's getting funny friend requests. Or that was Erica, right? She got that friend request, Erica. How come I don't get one? When are they coming over for supper? <laughs> if they do, will you record it? Will you invite me over? That's the best thing. If they go, just invite me over. I'd love to have a discussion. I would be very kind. I would. I would. Of course I would. Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. We're not going to get into 13, really, and the reason why we're not going to is that needs its own message for, for Lord willing next week. And the reason it needs its own is because we're going to talk about, and I've talked about it before a, a few years back, maybe three or four, maybe, well, maybe it's been six years ago. I don't know. I can't remember if I preached that in 2016 or 17. I might have been 16 um, on exorcism and a few things that were going on there at the time. But I really now want to really tackle that verse in the light of a lot of um, uh, things that, that I've experienced along the way in my ministry and just different things. So we're, we'll deal with 13 next week, but we're going to talk about special miracles versus counterfeit charismania today at tonight. And the reason we need to talk about that is because it keeps coming up and the defense that charismatics use is they will use, they will use, um, the uh, the book of Acts. They will use it to try to make a comparison. Uh, now, I, I'm going to say this again probably in the midst of this sermon. Let me read the verses, then we'll get started here. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. That's amazing, isn't it? Uh, yeah, they were miracles. Special, that's right, special miracles. That's what we're going to talk about, the special miracles versus counterfeit uh, charismania. Father in heaven, Lord, please help us now as we go through this. Help us to understand and to grow thereby. Thank you so much for all you do for us. Lord, please help us and feed us with your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the one thing that we have to understand is, is that, number one, whenever you have the real, you will have the counterfeit. Always. It, Satan does not take very long before once the real gospel is preached, once the real Bible is there, once the, the uh, true converts are there. How long did it take before the, in the Antioch for the revival to take place there? The revival is going on and then Simon the sorcerer shows up and he tries to buy the Holy Ghost and because he, he wants more mojo. He wants more magic, right? He wants to add to his to his magic. See, magicians, what they do is they travel around and they learn. You, you know, it's funny, movies like, like Star Wars and Return of the Jedi and all those movies, they teach you, actually what they teach you is occultism. Yes. I mean, they teach you actually how wizards and, and how those people really work, and they do that. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. In modern day life, when you saw men like Prince and Michael Jackson and everything else, well, people think Michael Jackson bought the, uh, the Beatles uh, playbook uh, Sony or Sony uh, uh, playbook or whatever you call it of all their 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 book of all their songs just because he liked the Beatles and he wanted to make money on them. Well, he did it for that reason, but that always goes along with with the deception. That always goes along. But he bought it because he wanted the devils that were attached to it. He wanted he wanted the devils and the demonic activity that was attached to it at the time, the power that they had. So they go around and they, they, they go to different places literally to try to get that power from people. That's exactly what they do. My battery, it says AF peak. Maybe that's nothing. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just peaking. It's, your booming voice. it's my booming voice. Okay. All right. But uh, anyway, so that's, that's part of what, that's part of, uh, what witches do, and that's part of what 
counterfeit charismatics do. That's kind of what they do. So the first point I want to make to you tonight is that counter, the counterfeit is, a, is an antichrist attribute. One thing that you have to understand about the spirit of antichrist is that it is not uh, completely opposites. See, that's where, that's where you'll misunderstand something. If you think the only definition of antichrist or anti or being opposed to or a Christ or anything like that, if you don't understand the, the entire uh, scope of that, then you'll, you'll be confused okay, about that. Because really, that's not where the power lies. Where the power lies is in the deception. Where the power lies is in the fact that with, with the antichrist, he is the counterfeit Christ. That's what he is. Just like Roman Catholicism is very powerful. Why is it? Because it's counterfeit Christianity. Amen. It's so close, not, so, not, not to those that are saved, but to the world and to those that are under deception, it is so close to reality, to the truth, to true Christianity. I mean, after all, they say God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Yeah, but what else do they say? Right. What else do they say? What else do they do, though? You have to look at the entire package and understand the whole thing. Amen. So it, it means it's counterfeit. And the reason why we're going to talk about the counterfeit, then we're going to get to the special miracles is uh, because this is where the, the charismatics go. They always go to the book of Acts. And they're Acts 243 or 248 Christians, and they're, they believe in miracles. And, and have you, do you have the evidence of, of the Holy Ghost by speaking in tongues? And they ask all these questions, right? And they make all these assertions. This is nothing more than the principles of the tares among the wheat or the principle of signs and lying wonders that the scripture warn us about. If we, if we better know the real, we will be able to spot the fake. It's just like money. When you look at money, if you can find, if you, if you can spot what a real dollar bill looks like, right, compared to one that is not, then you can understand, okay, so what do they teach you to do? They teach you to study the real dollar so you know it. Like when a guy's bouncing or, or a cashier or something like that, they look at the real dollar bill and they get to know it, and then they know what its signs are, and then they look at the other one and they look at the face and they know, well, that's not real. Why? Because I know the original so well. If you'll know Christ well, if you'll study Christ who he is, you'll not be deceived by any of the Antichrist antics. You'll not be deceived by any of them. That's why God has called every Christian to draw closer to God and to know Christ. We are warned about this, and the principle is, is in the scriptures. When we study Christ, we learn what the real is. And that is why the chief aim of your Christian life is looking unto Jesus. It is not looking unto yourself. It is not looking in the world. It is not looking to anything else but looking unto Jesus. That's your chief aim in this life. Because the more our eyes are on Jesus, the more we can recognize that Antichrist spirit. The more you can see it. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. In so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out, coming, cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Mark 13, 22, For false Christs and false prophets shall rise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. You know, I was just reading an article by... Um, uh, what's his name? J.D. Hall. J.D. Hall, and he was talking about Billy Graham, and he was talking about Glenn Beck, and he said that Glenn Beck once had a meeting with Billy Graham, and there was another gentleman there, and Bi Billy Graham asked Glenn Beck his, his salvation testimony, and the other guy piped up and said, well, Billy, he's a Mormon, and Billy just like scoffed kind of at him and looked over at him as, and said, go on. And tell me your testimony. And he gave some testimony to Billy Graham. And Billy Graham says, oh, he sounds like a Christian to me. And then he took Mormonism off of his cult list. See? See, that's... Now, what was that? That's a wolf is what that is. And I'm not even talking about Glenn Beck. I'm talking about Billy Graham. He's a stinking wolf. That's exactly what he was. 
I don't buy all this stuff that everybody says about about him. I, I he led men astray. He led men back to the synagogues. He led men back to Rome. He had a Jesuit degree, an honorary one. Like what? What Protestant or Baptist would ever want a stinky, defiled, disgusting, written with the blood of the martyrs degree? from those devils. Why would you ever want that? Why would that be an honor? Why would you ever say that's an honor? See what I mean? But that's what the Bible warns us of. See, it's the, it's the so close to the real. It's the counterfeit. But take ye heed. Behold, I have foretold you all things. So then you and I must be aware that there are phony miracles or signs and lying wonders that they will perform. 1 Timothy 4.1 marks the age with the same thing. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. They're, they're departing, they're leaving. Departing the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So they give heed to the, what is Mormonism? Doctrines of devils. Mormons are not Christians. Mormons do not believe in the Christ of the Bible. They do not. They believe in another gospel delivered by the hand of another angel, which the Apostle Paul said, let him be accursed. Amen. That's plain and simple. If, you're, if you claim to be a born-again Christian, you're a Mormon, then you have to renounce, number one, you have to renounce the fact that Jesus is not the spirit brother of Satan. Amen. You would have to renounce that right away. You would have to renounce that there was no other testament that was given. You would have to renounce that Joseph Smith was not a prophet of God, but he was a polygamist, he was a womanizer, he had a talisman, and he was a devil. You would have to renounce those things. That he spoke to some angel that gave him his lucky golden ticket that he used to make a fortune on and to steal people's wives and daughters from them. And that's why he got shot and killed. Well, that, that, and he stole the secrets of the Mormon temple, and they were waiting outside, of the, or the, the, uh, the Masonic temple, and they were waiting outside there with some guns, and they took care of him, right? There's more doctrines you would, have to, you would have to renounce. You would have to believe, what would you have to do? Well, you would actually have to become a Christian, you fool, right? See, that's if Billy Graham was a true servant of God, then what would he have done? He would have told him, you have to repent of this. And you have to believe on Jesus Christ. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that at all. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Well, there's Roman Catholicism. 1 John 4, 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, wherever ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Well, that's Mormonism, by the way. Mormonism does the same thing. They do that. They deny. See, if your doctrine of Christ is not correct, who Christ is, the Son of God, God manifests in the flesh. If your doctrine is wrong, if you deny that, I didn't ask you what, you, if all you knew is that Jesus was Lord and Savior and you trusted him when you got saved, praise the Lord, <laughs> right? But if you learn later more about Christ, but you reject it, you reject the Bible, what it says, and the Bible says, you're accursed because you don't believe in the only begotten Son of God. You're rejecting that, Right? It's not about everything you knew when you were saved. It's about what do you believe now? Do you believe the plain word of God when it's spoken to you? Or do you need another testament? Because what are those? Those are signs and lying wonders. Right? And it always has to be a vision. When they're going to teach you something different, when these charismatics are going to teach you something different, they got to have a dream. They got to have a vision. They got to have something else. Why? Because they don't know how to teach this. So they got to teach you something else. Right? They don't have a foundation. I was thinking about that last night when the wind was blowing hard. And I was reading those verses about the house that was on a sure foundation, right? It was on the rock. It was founded on the rock and how it wouldn't move and how God said that though the, wind, the winds will bash against it. 
you hear tonight the winds are gonna bash against your faith they are going to this world is gonna bash against your faith the devil's gonna bash against your faith everything's gonna bash against your faith but my anchor holds it holds I can tell you I know it holds I know it holds amen and i don't care if any of you get excited about that because i know what god did in me and i'm excited about it tonight i'm not out there wandering around i'm not out there lost and dead in sins i know where my rock is it's right there and you need to have it if you don't and if you have it you better start trusting him that's all i got to say you can be wandering a long time if you don't get fit if you don't get firm on that rock and believe god in what he says you're going to be shaky for a long time, friend. I know what it's like to shake a little bit and have God shake you up. Shaking up, but not shaking out. I'll tell you that right now. Amen. And not by these stinking devils right here that are teaching these false miracles and things out there right now. You know what this world wants? They want the Antichrist. You know what these false churches want? They want the Antichrist. And they're going to get him. They're going to get what they want. They are going to get what they want. They, they, he is going to come on the scene and they are going to get what they want. They're going to get the signs and the lying wonders that they're begging for. They're begging for them and they're going to get them. Right? Because they, why do they get them? Because they receive not the love of the truth. Right? But God showed us what those things were. And he said, no, you believe this. You know, God took me through a meat grinder for four years, and, and his basic lesson was me was back to the beginning, son. It's the basic lesson. You're going to trust me, and you're going to trust this book. That's what you're going to do. And you're, I don't care how you feel. I don't care what you go through. I don't care what your problem is. You're going to trust me. I don't care how dark it is outside, how bad it is. You're going to trust me. When it's all said and done, you're going to desire me and you're going to trust me. And me alone, that's what you're going to do. You're not going to care what any man thinks about you. You're going to trust God. That's what you're going to do. And that's the lesson you've got to learn the same way. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the counterfeit. And we have, we have many. Remember, he didn't say one false Christ would arise, did he? What did he say? Many. He didn't say one false prophet was coming. He said many. Many. And down through the last 2,000 years, we've seen many false prophets, many false Christs arise, speaking perverse things, right? To draw men away after them, to draw away men after them, right? That's, that's what their goal was. And what did Joseph Smith do? He and draw men away after him. You want to know why anybody that ever proclaimed to be a Baptist fell into Mormonism? You want me to tell you the simple reason? They didn't know this book. And they didn't know the Savior of this book either. That's why. Because all you got to do is read it to know that guy's full of beans. You just, you just have to read the book and look at him and say, that, that guy's, he's full of a lot of hot air and he's a pervert. Right? So we see those counterfeit miracles come from Satan. And they are end times. And we're going to get to that a little bit. By the way, they are act absolutely, and I'm going to say this again to you at the end, because we're Baptists, so we have to have things said to us at least 100 times, and then a and then hundred more, and then another hundred more, and then another hundred more, and then another hundred more. I will put you in remembrance again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Though you once thought this, he didn't say that. I'll put you in remembrance though you once thought this. Right, Jacob? Is that what he said? I will put you in remembrance though you once thought this. You thought about this. No, no, no. He said, though you once knew this. Wait, you mean you can know something and then at times you can let it slip? Oh, yeah. Sure you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Number two, these special miracles were wrought by God. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. 
God used Paul's hands. He used Paul's body. He used Paul. You know, we are vessels of the living God. That's what we are. We're, we're just to be used of God. That's, you're here to glorify God. You're here to be used of God. You're not your own. You're bought and paid for by, with a price. You know, you know, here's the thing that you think you and I think sometimes. You and I think that, that like, we should prescribe our own trials because, you know, we're our own people. So we know what's best and what God should allow to happen to our lives. And we know, we know how to order our, our lives, and we should. I mean, after all, if some guy wants a promotion at work, all he does is head in that direction. He does something, and he seems to get it. If he wants to do an investment, if he wants a house, if he wants land, if he wants, and they just seem to get it. But, or a successful chiropractor, some of them are very successful right away and they, get, they, they make a ton of money right away and everything else, and you, you don't get to have all that luxury right away. Right? You think about that. Well, 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 they're their own men, that's why. You're not your own. You're not. And just like the trials that you're going through right now, whatever they may be, whatever your trial is right now, it's ordered by God. <laughs> you think, well, this happened by accident, something, it's this, it's... No, no, it, it was ordered by God. I just can't imagine God ordering this for me. Well, don't imagine it, just believe it. Nobody asked you to imagine anything. Believe it. You, you don't have to imagine anything. In fact, shut that thing off. That thing will get you in a lot of trouble. You cast that down. Don't worry about what you imagine. Well, actually, don't even think about those things too long, right? About your imagination. No, no, no. You focus on what real is. What's real? Well, God ordered your trial. Your work, God ordered it that way. It's, it's there for a reason. Right? It's, it's there for a reason. No, it's the world and this happened and that happened. No. No, God allowed it to happen. God allowed it to happen. That's, that's why it's happening. I mean... It's, it's not an accident, right? I mean, who could have all the money that they would need to to do something, and then you can't do it? Right? Well, I mean, all you can say is that, that the Lord's doing that, that that's what God's doing. God's allowing that to happen. Because anybody else could just go and just do it, right? And if God wanted it done, it would be done. And nothing would stop it. Right? Right? That's, that's, how, that's how it is. If God wanted, so I want you to think about it this way. If God wanted the trial that you're in right now over, done. 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 Do you believe that? I do. Because <laughs> I know it. I know it. I know it from what God's word says, and I know it from experience that when God says it's over, it's over. And God just, that's it, done. Right? That's how God works. Anyway, that was free, sort of. It is costing, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Matthew Henry, though, asks a, a good question about these special miracles. He said, God confirmed Paul's doctrine by miracles, which awakened people's inquiries after it, fixed their affections to it, and engaged their belief. I wonder we have not read, I wonder why we have not read of any miracles wrought by Paul since the casting of the evil spirit out of the damsel at Philippi. Why did he not work miracles at Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens? Or if he did, why are they not recorded? Was the success of the gospel without miracles in the kingdom of nature itself such a miracle in the kingdom of grace and that the divine power which, we, which went along with it such a proof of its divine original that there needed no other? Good questions. You know, why did God... Because it's simply the reason why it's because God chose to do it that way. Man, I'll tell you what. What you're going through right now, you can chalk it all... Man, you can figure out every mistake you make. You can go through a list. And you can write down everything you did wrong in your business since you were a little boy even. <laughs> you can go back to when you're, it all started in third grade, right? You can, you, can, you, can go, you can go back and you can do it, right? And you can make, and you can make a list up. 
a spreadsheet of everything you did wrong. And you can and you can go back and by the way, Satan will love for you to do that. If you'll just keep doing that, Satan loves that. Because as long as you're focused on that, you ain't never moving forward. Never. You are gonna sit there and you are gonna sulk over it all. You're gonna fret over it all. You're gonna man, my sermon wasn't even about this. But that's what that's what you're gonna do. You're that's that's what you'll do. If if Satan gets you to do that, right, then you'll just be but you can chalk it all up to this is what the Lord wanted. God's trying to teach me something through this. What, what does that mean? That means God is actually, you know what he's doing? He's actually picking you up and he's taking you somewhere. That's what. Some of you go through some trials and I look at it and, and, and you're very fearful and you're afraid. I know what that's like. Believe me, trust me, I know what that's like. Just because I spent three years not telling you what it was like and waited till the next year to tell you a lot of things doesn't mean I didn't go through it. I went through it, believe me. Me and this room, if these walls could talk, oh my. Um, <laughs> if, they, if they could, oh my, oh my, would they say some things. Thank God they can't. And I believe the devil can't hear my prayers either. Amen. I don't believe the devil can hear me cry out to God. I don't believe it for a second. I don't believe he can hear anything I say to God. Why? That's private communication. That's why. I don't believe he can hear a thing. Say he's got ears. So I don't know what he's got. He's got hoofs. I know that. But I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you this right now. That's between me and God. Right? That's between me and God. I don't believe he can, I don't believe he can have anything to do with our prayers. Just to try to hinder him. Right? He can try to affect you. He knows you're going to pray, but I believe the Lord knows it. The Lord knows everything that we're going to say, and I believe Satan can. I don't believe he can know that like that, but you know what? God wants you to pray. God wants you to bring, God is bringing you to that place. All your fears and everything else, that's the reason. God wants you to, God wants you to seek his face. He wants you to find him in everything, to find God. That's a miracle in itself right there. I'll tell you that right now. These miracles right here, they were not a normal response. It wasn't normal to have miracles. That's why the scripture here calls them special. These were the signs of an apostle. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible talks about the signs of an apostle. And these, were, these special miracles were signs. If they weren't special and everybody could do them and every New Testament believer could do them, they wouldn't be special. Right? Right? I mean, that's pretty simple, isn't it? That's just logical, isn't it? Boy, don't be that logical. You can't be that logical when you're dealing with spooky charismatics. Because, man, they got to they gotta spook it up. They got to spook it up. They just have to. They were great miracles. The Bible talks about these special miracles. They could not be faked, but they accompanied the doctrine he preached. See, Paul's, Paul's miracles, they accompanied that doctrine. God set it out for a purpose. That's why he allowed them to do that. He set out to, Paul didn't set out to do miracles. You understand that, right? Paul didn't say, for Christ sent me to do miracles. He didn't say that. What did he say? Christ sent me to preach the gospel. Why do all these buffoons go out? And why do all, why, why do all these buffoons go out? And these wizards and, these, and these, uh, these magicians that call themselves charismatics and these holiness people and all these other people, why do they all go out? And why do they go out and they set out to do these things? They set out to do miracles. And we're going to get to the healing crusades next. But they, they set out to do miracles. Where in the Bible does it say, I'm supposed to set out to do miracles? No, I'm supposed to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's what God's called us to do, not to set out to do miracles. Paul never set out to do miracles. He set out to preach Christ and him crucified. In fact, when he got to Corinth, he said, I don't want to hear anything from you, but Christ and him crucified. I want to know when you were saved. I want to know what work God's doing in your heart. I don't care about all the fancy philosophizing and all that other stuff. I want to know what God's done in your heart. Amen. Paul wanted them to, his, Paul's goal was to preach Christ, that they would know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Your whole Christian life is about you being more like Christ. Paul preached the gospel so you'd get saved by the blood of Christ and that you would be like Christ. That's why. Here today, right now, here tonight, you're here because God wants you to be more like Christ. God saved you for you to be like his son. Why? Because his son is the only thing that pleases him. 
Amen. You believe that, don't you? Right? His, wait, you mean my good works can't? Well, your good works in Christ can, yeah. In Christ. My obedience to the Lord doesn't please God. In Christ it does, yeah. Remember, you're dead. And your life is hidden Christ. You're, yeah, everything you do in Christ pleases God. Absolutely. Why? Because you have a covering over you. Because when God sees what you do, he sees Christ. So that's why he's pleased. Right? That's why. Not, not because of you. There's, there's still nothing good in your flesh. <laughs> still nothing good. I've been saved 20 years and I can say, still nothing good. Still nothing good. Right? And by the way, the longer you'll save, the more you'll realize that. Man, when you first get saved, you're, you're on fire for God. And man, you're thinking you're pretty good. You're pretty hot stuff. Well, the longer you're saved, the more trials you go through. And the closer you get to God, you start realizing, man, it stinks. What stinks? You stink. What's that smell? You. Right? That's my flesh. That's that no good thing. That's that smell. What's that foul smell when I try to serve God? My flesh. I mean, it stinks more than it did before when I, when I first got saved. No, you're just more sensitive to it. Your spiritual senses are exercised. Mm -hmm. That's why. To discern, that's right. Man, I look back. I was just praying today. And I started looking back, and I'll, I'll try to be careful about that because, man, I don't want to go down that road too far. But I started looking back at a few things, and, and I was thinking about how God delivered me from so many things. And things that I didn't even realize God delivered me from. Like, I look back at it, and I, I'm like, and I mean after I got saved, and I was newly saved, Satan had all these traps for me, and my own stupid flesh did. And I started looking back, and I was thinking about it. I was like, wow, God just delivered me from all that. Like, he just kept me from all of that. I could have been destroyed by those things. And he kept me from them. That's God's power. That's God's grace. It wasn't me. It wasn't, it wasn't me. Right? It was God's grace that kept me from that. Man, I could have been destroyed. And you know what? The reason why... It, it makes more sense to me now is because it's 20 years later and I look back and I see the depravity, you know, and I see how strong that depravity is and how wicked it is and how vile my flesh is and how my flesh would be consumed if it weren't for God's grace to hold my spirit, right? To keep my spirit in this fleshly wicked body, right? The new man. Every day. This, this flesh, the longer you're saved, this flesh is going to drop. One day, it's dying. Th this is dying. It's dying. Right? It's, it's all going to die. I mean, it's going to die. But the spirit, the spirit is going to be with the Lord. So the spirit is going to go. Why does it feel weaker sometimes? Well, because your flesh is weaker. It doesn't mean your spirit is, right? It doesn't mean your spirit is, but your flesh is. You're right, and there's a war. There's a war. Is that simple enough? Number three or four, whatever number it is, the miracles were not a healing crusade. The most effective argument for the Christian life today, for the Christian today of miracles, is a transformed life in Christ. You want to know the, the greatest miracle ever, the most effective argument ever that I can make? Is if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That is the most powerful, that is the most powerful miracle that I could ever preach to you. That is the most powerful one that I could ever show you. That is the most, that is the most uh, amazing common salvation. The common salvation, right? Like Jude talked about, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. 
right? He was writing about the common salvation, but he said, you know what? It's just a common salvation. But that's the greatest miracle I can tell you about. The, for any miracle, if you ask, for, for God to take somebody from this world, rotten and dead in sins, right? And to save their soul and to lift their spirit and to make them new and to breathe life into them where there's nothing but death and to make their life useful. That's salvation. That's what it is. And that's a miracle. If modern day miracles that go on today outside of that, the charismatic counterfeit miracles, if modern day miracles were real, there would be no debate. You understand that, right? No one debated whether Christ truly healed anybody on the Sabbath day. They just told him he shouldn't be doing it. None of them debated, well, did he really heal him? Does he really have the power to heal him? They knew he had the power to heal him. They didn't debate that. They watched it. They, they tried to talk him out of doing it because it was on the Sabbath day. They said, he shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. They condemned him for it. Not because they didn't believe he had the power to do it. On the contrary, they were afraid of the power to do it. But today, these miracles are debated, right? These modern-day miracles that these uh, fools, the charismatic fools use. Modern-day charismatics like Kenneth Copeland have a bunch of people show up to a controlled environment and promote a healing crusade. Paul never did that. Paul never advertised some special meeting to heal people. The miracles were complete. All sorts of diseases were healed and de devils were cast out. There's no example in Acts that the apostles ever attempted to heal and failed. Besides, you know, in Acts, that is. Now, before, when the demon wasn't, devil wasn't cast out of the one and Jesus had to do it, that was a different story. But in the Acts, we never see that. In contrast, the vast majority of those who come to modern Pentecostal healing meetings are not healed. Only in a few cases are healings even claimed. And those that are examined are usually found to be bogus. Much of this is from David Cloud's uh, book on the, the phony charismatic movement. But like Christ, the apostles did not do miracles as a pattern for other believers to imitate. They did miracles as signs of their apostleship. By the miracles, they proved that they were called to be God, called of God to be apostles by God. Even in the early churches, all Christians could not do the miracles. The only exceptions were a few men upon whom the apostles had laid hands. There was a reason for that, to show that, they had, that the apostles had that power that God had granted. There was no general miracle working experience among the first churches. If there had been, Paul could not have pointed to his miracle working ability as a special sign of his apostleship. If all could have performed miracles as a matter of course, the Christians at Joppa would not have called for Peter to come from Lydda and raise Dorcas from the dead. Why would they? Peter's miracles that day were a sign of his apostleship. You have to be careful about these phony crusades that you see and these phony miracles. Many people are fooled by these. They're fooled by the tongues movement. See, here's how the devil works. How he works is, just like Roman Catholicism does, if you see, like we said, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost in the Scriptures, well, Rome says, well, we believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, so therefore we're those people in the Bible. And we have the... We have, uh, the um, the perpetuity of Peter, right, and in his office. We, we have that, right? right? Yeah, the apostolic succession. We have that, right? So therefore, we are those people. Wait a minute. But a discerning mind has to take the scriptures and discern. Well, your God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost is submissive to Mary. You have a co-redemptress. You worship idols. You pray to statues. You venerate them, whatever you want to call them. You kiss them. Right? You make idols and you bow down yourself to them and you serve them. You change the Ten Commandments so you could get away with idolatry. You're devils. That's what false prophets do. That's what the papacy does. Right? So what they do, though, is that's how Satan works, though. He takes just, well, let me, Simon the Sorcerer showed up to the revival. He let him baptize him. He said he believed. He let him baptize him. And then he tried to buy the Holy Ghost. He said, Peter, is there any way I can get in on this? 
I mean, I saw you do that, and that was a pretty cool trick. And, you know, I've been doing tricks for a while, but I can't do that trick. So if we could work something out, you know, I can slip you a little bit of cash. Pete? You know what I'm saying, Pete? If I could slip you a little dough, slip it under the door, nobody will know anything. Give me some of that Holy Ghost. <laughs> right? Right? Come on, sell me some of that. Money for Mojo. That's right. Come on, sell me some of that. Come on, Pete. Well, Peter wasn't buying that and told him, Well, you're in trouble, boy. And then history records Simon Sorcerer did a lot of weird stuff. <laughs> He became the greatest antichrist enemy of the church. And, well, let's just say he levitated across the temple and did a lot of weird stuff. But anyway, that's, that's besides the point. But, but so suffice it to say that there are counterfeits among the true, and that's the way it is. But their goal is always to, their goal is not to know Christ. Their goal is gain money to draw men away after them. That's their goal. These people have a perverse spirit. They have another gospel. You know, in the Bible we see that Timothy was not healed supernaturally of his often infirmities. Trophimus was not healed when he was sick. Melitum was left sick. Paul was not healed of the sickness described in 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, the Greek, uh, he talks about the Greek word infirmity, infirmity elsewhere translated sickness or whatever. Anyway, the affliction that Paul had, the thorn in his flesh. Three times Paul asked God to take away this affliction, but the Bible says he refused to do so. Paul was told that this infirmity was something God wanted him to have for his spiritual well-being. Upon learning this, Paul surrendered to God's will and wisely said, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. This is a perfect example for Christians today. We should pray for healing and release from other kinds of trials. But when God does not heal and does not release us, we must bow to his will and accept that situation as something from the hand of God. That's not a lack of faith. It is wise obedience to the sovereignty of God Almighty. Man, I know what that's like. Back when my back four years ago, almost five years ago now, uh, when when my mind melted twice, <laughs> once and then boom again, uh, hit it again uh, a year later. When that happened, I I I prayed a lot for the Lord to heal my mind. I I prayed for hours. <laughs> and days, and months, and years. I was depressed for three years straight. Yeah, at least three years, three to four years straight. I had complete depression, and I prayed, and I asked God to take it away. Then I understood that I had depression, desertion, and a condition of anxiety. I don't mean I worried about stuff. There's a difference. There's a difference. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a difference. There's a difference. When your brain fires a certain way from now on and here on out, that's, that's not the same thing. But anyway, the point was is that I prayed and asked the Lord, and finally God brought me to a place where I was like, I'm not going to do this for you. You say, did God say that to you? He didn't have to. But yeah, he did. But not with an audible voice. He just spoke to me and told me, you ain't getting rid of that. <laughs> you, you know what he said to me? I will give you almost anything else you ask for. And he proved it over and over again. That's how I knew that God said, no, I, I'm, I'm with you. And I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to be with you all the way until you come home. But I'm not taking that away from you. I'm not taking that away from you. Because this will keep you out of trouble. <laughs> this will keep you from trusting yourself. This will keep you from leaning on your own understanding. This will keep you from, from uh, uh, trusting in the arm of flesh. You will trust me and you won't go to something else or someone else or trust your feelings or anything else because I won't let you. So that'll stay. That's the lesson that Paul had in 2 Corinthians 12, right? 
many of these many of these false healers teach so many different things out there. Paul didn't do that. Those people that that were healed, done instantly. Jesus, when he healed them, done. Right. Guys like Oral Roberts, right? Oh. Yeah, Oral Ripoff. That's right. In March 1952, issue of his magazine, Healing Waters, had three great medical doctors on the cover. Three great medical doctors. Bragging on Roberts, but this was exposed as a lie. They weren't real doctors. Pastor Carol Stiegel investigated Roberts' healing claims and found no change in anyone. A Toronto doctor examined 32 people that were supposedly healed through Roberts' ministry and found no case of healing. At least one had died. At a healing meeting in Texas in 1950, a storm knocked the healing tent down and 50 people had to go to the hospital. <laughs> Between 1951 and 1959, five people died in Robert's healing meetings. So they trusted him. So some of these people didn't take whatever. And what? chemotherapy, whatever you believe about it, whatever, that's your personal decision to make, right? That's your, but whatever, they would forego that and just trust and believe that Earl Roberts is going to heal them. So they died. Five people died to me. They died because they thought that guy was going to heal them. Do you get it? Mm-hmm. And of course, in 1977, Roberts claimed God commanded him to build a hospital. And in 1980, he claimed he saw a 900-foot-tall Jesus who promised he would pay all the bills for the hospital, that it would be a success. <laughs> the real funny thing is, is that people gave him millions of dollars. But in 1989, the hospital closed because of debts. Yeah, debts, probably both, right? He saw 900 foot tall, and you could see him and uh, Kenneth Copeland. By the way, after all this, these people are still going to meetings and doing these, these God wants you to be rich meetings, and all these people are all together, and they're, they're calling Oral R Roberts, the ripoff master there. They're calling him like a great guy and everything else. And him, meanwhile, you, if you go back and watch that video that I did on these guys, Kenneth Copeland and Oral Roberts, uh, Oral Roberts is standing up there and he says, look on us, look on us. And he look, and he, Kenneth Copeland's looking on him. He goes, silver and gold have we plenty. Wait, that's not how the verse goes. It goes silver and gold. Yeah. Yeah, silver and gold have we plenty. And they were all, they started jumping up and down, getting really excited. Right? William Bronham, another one, his, his uh, healing campaigns in 1946 were the start of the modern Pentecostal healing revivals. We covered a lot of this in that. I won't go through all that. But he claimed that an angel always stood by him and told him what to say. Bet he did. A fallen one. See, I don't, see, people don't, people deny that. Like they say, oh, he was making it up. I don't think he was making it up. I think there is a devil sitting right next to him. I believe it. Because you can't get that many thousands of people to be that stupid unless there's a devil there. Right? You just can't be that dumb to believe that idiot. You can't. You can't. And I'm being nice when I say he's an idiot. I'm serious. I'm being nice. Believe me. He claimed that an angel always stood by him and told him what to say. He said that he could distinguish types of sickness by vibrations in his hands. We have the personal testimony of Albert Pohl, a former Pentecostal who worked in one of Branham's crusades in Saskatoon. Pohl prayed for the bedridden patients who were transported to the meeting, and he declared all of them healed, but many died soon thereafter. A local newspaper checked on the reported healings and couldn't find one genuine case. Then you have Catherine Kuhlman. Remember that lady? She was Benny Hinn's mama. Well, spiritual mama. <laughs> Surgeon, Will Surgeon, <laughs> Surgeon William Nolan published the book, A Doctor in Search of a Miracle, about his attempt to find cases of people who were genuinely healed through Kuhlman's ministry. He didn't find any such cases. 
Kurt Cook examined 28 alleged healings that occurred under Coleman's ministry in Minneapolis, but he didn't find even one clear case of healing from an organic disease. Then you have John Wimber. He was the leader of the Vineyard Churches. Those are popular. Here, there's one over in Faribault. He conducted a Signs and Wonders conference and taught that every Christian should lay hands on the sick and heal them. At a conference in Indianapolis in 1990 that I attended, uh, said David Cloud here, he said that God had sent healing angels, but I didn't see any healings of those who were in the wheelchairs. After a Wimber crusade in England, five medical doctors found no genuine healings and called his ministry hypnosis. Do you believe it was hypnosis? Yes. Demonically inspired hypnosis. Yes, I do. Yes, absolutely. And that's how the Antichrist is going to work. That's how the metaverse is going to work. Hang on, it's going to get crazy. Um, in an interview with the magazine in Australia in 1990, Wimber said he could heal headaches, but that he, had, he did not have success with serious sickness. I could help you with your headache. So can I give you a Tylenol. Right? Right? Or maybe massage your neck and it'll go away, right? Or tell you to drink some water. You're probably dehydrated, right? Andrew's taking his eyeballs out over there. You see that? He put his eyeballs in that case. Look at that. How did he do that? Anyway, that was weird. That is right here. What's going on? He just, I just saw that guy take his eyeballs out. He just <coughs> popped him in there and put on new goggles. <laughs> Charles and Francis Hunter, they had a wide-reaching re healing ministry and claimed that healing is promised by God that every Christian can heal others. During one healing crusade in the Philippines, Francis Hunter, Hunter had to go to the doctor for a sickness, and another time she had to be transported home in a wheelchair. Charles Hunter claimed that he could heal baldness, but he was bald until his death. Yeah, even Abigail thought that one was funny. <laughs> I watched this video, and I'm almost done with these because I don't want to get too far into this, but I want the comparisons important because your friends are going to come to you and say, well, do you believe in all this and do you believe that? And people you know out there, they're, they're Pentecost I mean, there's a lot of Pentecostals, a lot of Charismatics, a lot of them, a lot of them, and they're sucking away a lot of people into those movements, and it's all, and it's all phony. But I watched uh, Kenneth Copeland my, my daughter was at, at my daughter, Mandy and, and Lucius, we were watching it. It was late at night. That's what I do for fun sometimes. Um, but to <laughs> make fun of charismatics with popcorn, it's great. But uh, anyway, but I, was, but I was watching this and Kenneth Copeland was walking around. And there was these poor people. They're like paraplegics or whatever. And they're in wheelchairs and he's walking around acting like he's healing them. And he's like grabbing their hands and massaging. And then flew I bind you, his wife walks up and she's like rubbing their back. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. And she's like, her mantra goes on and on, right? And she's continuing to, and they're rubbing, rubbing the hands of these. Yes. And like, she's like touching them all over with all their devils, uh, making their lives worse. Like they're going to start on fire right there. And that, that's, and right. And then all of a sudden, right, nothing happens. They don't get up out of the wheelchair. He knocked one guy out of the wheelchair in the video. He knocked that guy right off his feet. Well, he wasn't on his feet. He was in the wheelchair, but he knocked him back. And this guy's like flying back in the air. Poor guy. I mean, he's, he can't get up. Right, all the body, bodyguards are coming in, lifting him up, right? 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 You can't forget about that. Years ago, she did the flu, I bind you, Gloria greatest video ever, right? Flew I, besides T.D. Jakes' video. Um, but, um, right? And then Kenneth Copeland, of course, this year, or actually two years ago, when COVID first happened, he blew COVID away and it came back somehow. I don't know. Um, he, he blew it and then he, he blew it and then he, and then, uh, then he, he called it down and told it to get off its throne as if it was a person and had legs and it could walk. Um, Apparently, it was supposed to walk out of its throne and get up and leave, but it didn't. Uh, it stayed here, and his, one of his best friends died. One of his best evangelical, well, not evangelical, excuse me. One of his best charismatic buddies died of it. Oh, yeah, right in front of him. Mm -hmm. God's going to heal him. He said, God's going to heal him. We don't believe this. COVID's going to take him down. God's going to heal him. He died like the next day. And then what do people do? 
Still give him billions of dollars. Still give him money. Keep giving him money. You know, he turned COVID into a demon and cast it out. Only it didn't work. Flu still got worse. People still got sick. There's a spitting video, too, where he tried to... That's a good one, actually. Right? But none of that is like the apostles did. Right? Unlike some Pentecostal healers such as Oral Roberts, Paul did not make the make and distribute handkerchiefs here. Paul didn't do that. The people brought handkerchiefs and touched him with them and then touched the sick. And they were healed. Some of the Pentecostal healing evangelists have sent out pieces of cloth and urged the people to believe and return the cloth with their miracle request. They sold cloths to people, prayer cloths. You ever seen that? They'll sell prayer cloths. Now, I firmly believe those prayer cloths and those things that these charismatics are selling, I think they're charged objects that have devils. Like, I, if you, like they just want to put devils in your home, right? They want to they do that. They want to, and God will give you over to your own delusion if you want it, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and why did Paul use the handkerchiefs? Was it something out of the ordinary? No, it wasn't. Well, if you were making tents and you're in the Middle East and it's hot, what are you going to do? God was showing that it was, it says that God wrought special miracles by, right. It, he just used what he had. He just used the handkerchief was there and he just used it and God did it. We don't even know if Paul knew everything that was happening. I don't know everything God does in this ministry. When sermons go out, sometimes like joy. I heard like two years later or something like that, or a year later or whatever. What God, we don't know what God's doing with our, with, we don't know what God's always doing. We have no clue, right? What God's doing with, with everything like that. There was no money involved in, with these healings. In contrast with many famous Pentecostal faith healers today who have attempted to use the promise of miracles to raise a lot of money. They get rich off of poor, ignorant, deceived people. They point to the Bible and say, see, healing's in the Bible. We heal. Send it in. That's why you need to know the Bible so you don't get deceived by devils. They were called special miracles for a reason. Right? That's what they were called for a reason. Now, no one can perform these apostolic signs today. When the Bible talks about miracles in the end times, in the end of the church age at this time, whenever this ends, it always warns us that, there will be, that they will always be false. Do you understand that? Matthew 24, 24 says they're going to be false. Right? 2 Thessalonians says they're going to be false. Revelation chapter 13 says they're going to be false. They're all done by the power of what? Satan. Whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish for, because they received not the love of the truth for this cause, right? God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Right. And there's a warning that I would give you, just like Paul gave here. Don't seek after signs. Don't spend your Christian life expecting God to give you certain signs. Don't live your life by that. Don't judge whether you have favor with God by certain signs that you're expecting to come to pass by God giving you certain things or not giving you certain things by God allowing you to be in despair by God trying you or by God blessing you by God prospering you or by God allowing you to be abased for a while. Don't judge your relationship with God on signs Stop looking for something that, for God to show you and lusting after that. No, you're supposed to believe God. Like I said, the one lesson that God gave me all through this. See, in my mind, when I was going through that for four years, in my mind, if I really knew that God was with me, he would take it all away and I would be better. And that would mean that God is with me. But God said, oh, no. I was like, well, what do you want from me then, God? I want you to trust me. 
I, I want you to believe me. Yeah, but Lord, you ain't really speaking to me. I mean, oh, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> Hear ye the rod, son, because <laughs> that's what you're getting. Oh, I'm speaking. Boy, I'm speaking, and you better listen, <laughs> right? And you're going to listen, right? You know, if you don't, when you don't listen to the voice of God through his word, you do listen when affliction comes, don't you? You ever notice that? How good your children's hearing get after they get, after they get punished? Man, they're hearing, they're, it's like they're hearing increases a hundredfold. Well, guess what? So does yours. When, when you don't listen to the, the word of God and the warnings from the word of God, and then God uses his rod to afflict you, then guess what? What do you do? You start listening. Now you're paying attention. Now you'll humble yourself. Now you'll believe me. Now you'll seek me. Now, you'll, now you won't play games with me. After time and time and again, God wanted devotion from you. He wanted time with you. He wanted you to, to, to search after him. He wanted you to seek after him, to fellowship with him, and you didn't do that. And now you go through a time where you don't feel like you can do it. Mm -hmm. That's called chastisement. That's what that's called. I don't feel like God hears me. Oh, he hears you. You ain't hearing him. But you will. You will. You will. That's why when you tell me you're in a place like that, I'm not afraid for you. Like, that's a good place. I said, Pastor, it don't feel good. I know it don't. It feels rotten. It feels horrible. It feels frightening. But you are in the safest place you can be because you are starting to listen. And again, that's not even what this is about. Sort of it is. but You and I can't be like the world, though. And I'm done. I know. i got to get out of here. You guys got to get home sometime here. Um, don't lust after signs. Don't lust after wanting to see something. i got to see. No, God's got to do this for me, or I have to see this in order to know that God's with me. No, God's with you because he said he was with you. Amen. Yeah, but I don't feel like he's with me. Well, who cares? Jonah didn't feel like God was with him either until he got in that boat. And then he got thrown into that sea. And then Jonah knew, I'm God's. And then when God came up, when that, when that uh, whale came up and swallowed him whole, and then he was down there and he said, out of the belly of hell I cried. You ever feel like that? Man, I have. I have. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Out of the belly of hell I cried. That's what Job said, or jo uh, Jonah said, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. Well, well, I mean, hell would mean that he felt like he was abandoned of God, and hell would mean like that he felt like he, was, he wasn't even God's child. And, and hell, I mean, if he felt like he was in hell, I mean, he would feel like he was completely, like, left and done, and God was finished with him, and he was all done, and he was in that... Yeah. But the funny thing is, is when Jonah was in that whale, he was closer to God than he'd been in a long time. Because God had his attention, didn't he? Right? Yeah, he was praying. Now he was praying, wasn't he? Now he was praying. Right? Oh, yeah. Now we would hear, don't seek after signs. You just be obedient to the Lord. You just trust God. You believe God. You believe him and you go on. By the way, if God shows you he's not going to do something for you and, and he showed you over and over again, why don't you just surrender it to God? You just surrender it to God. Say, Lord, it's yours. But Lord, I, but see, here's the problem. If you have your dreams, if you have your dreams, right, and what you want all the time, 
You still haven't learned the lesson yet. Right? Still haven't learned it yet. See, a lot of times, what you want is not bad. You just don't want to trust God for it. You want to get it yourself. It's not bad what you want. You just don't want to trust God for it. You, you want to do it all yourself. That'll never work. So you'll look for signs, and you'll look for this, and you'll look for that. No, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You just got to trust the Lord. Don't search after those things. You don't have to. That's what charismatics do. They follow after all. They're looking for a sign in everything that God had, God's favor is with them. It's not wrong to see God's blessings and give God the glory for when He blesses you with money and health and, and, and everything. There's nothing wrong with that. Hey, maybe He blesses you and you feel good that day. That's nothing wrong with that either. But if you lust after those things and you lust after those signs and you want God to show you something and give you a sign, right? It's like this. I'll, I'll, I'll make it simple, and then we'll get out of here. Here, I'll make it simple. It's like people that struggle with doubts about salvation or anything else. They, they're lusting. God, just show me I'm saved. Sh show me a sign. Well, you're... Wait, you're asking God to show you something special? And you know what he says? I wrote the whole thing for you! We have a more sure word of prophecy. What do you want me to do? <laughs> right? He sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for you. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He said, he that cometh to me, or he that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Right? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Well, he... He already wrote it all. I mean, he already showed you. The, the problem isn't that you need a sign. You need to believe what God already said. You need to believe God. I know I'm making it overly simple, and I keep saying that like the last week, because I believe God's impressed it upon my heart to continue to say that to you, that you just need to believe God. You, you really just need to believe God. You need to believe what God said. You need to believe what God, you need to believe God's promises. Why? Because you need to trust in who he is. Yeah. Christ paid all. He, he suffered it all. He who spared not his own son, but freely gave him up for us all. How shall he not with him? Right? Freely give us all things. Amen. Right? Your assurance does not come from some sign. Your assurance comes from you believing God. And God strengthening your faith. Because you believe in God. Don't ask God to do something that he's not going to do. Because God's not going to do that. He's not going to give you some special sign. <laughs> Something special outside of his scriptures. No, he already gave you this. And he said, walk ye in it. He told you to believe it. Amen. That's simplicity, ain't it? Got to love it. I don't have to worry about seeking after signs. I don't have some, have to have some special manifestation. I can just believe God. Amen. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for the book. Thank you for faith in Christ, the gift of God. Thank you for the Holy Ghost of God. 
Lord, the main lesson you're trying to teach us through all these things is to believe your word above all else, to believe you and what you said in your word above all else. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us to cling to you in all our trials, in all our tribulations, in everything we go through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.